No slides today. Anyway, I've been asked to come to the, the Architecture Biennale, so I thought I'd talk about architecture. I'm not going to talk about the architecture you think I'm going to talk about, but the architecture that will be in any gee whiz bang, look at modern technology theory or approach to architecture is going to be far more important than what you do. Up till now, every time, or most of the time, that I see people, or read people, or listen to people, talking about, oh gee, look what we can do, self-driving cars, we're going to have all this and that regulated, and everything's going to be wonderful, and we don't have to worry about things, except for maybe unemployment, but I won't talk about that today. Um, which I basically, being a technological optimist, am in favor of, but I think that uh, we do have to think much more about what we are doing. Life is going to change completely, given the current rates of change, given Moore's Law. Does everyone know what Moore's Law is here? Um, Moore's Law, every one and a half years, the computing power of a chip will double. Uh, computing power of a chip at the same cost will double, which means that we get ever faster computers. Uh, your iPhone could probably, well, I mean, in fact, your iPod, <coughs> iPhone does have more computing, far more computing power than the computer that went to, that took man to the moon. This is a sign of that. Um, the problem is we have to understand what Moore's, that Moore's law is exponential. I remember talking to the European Parliament last autumn. I said, you have to really take this technology sort of thing a little more seriously because given Moore's law in four and a half years, that's three iterations of 1.5 years. What that means is that in the next time you have an election in four and a half years, uh, computers will be two to the third cox ostmes kolm, if you're Estonian, more powerful, and someone said, what is two to the third? So, learn your math. Now, when we look at technology and how it has changed mankind, uh, I guess the first step would be about 10,000 years ago, where after half a million years of being hunters and gatherers and uh, killing mastodons and dragging them to the cave, we settled down and we became farmers. Uh, we became agriculturalists. We know we're no longer, in general, um, hunters, gatherers, and nomads living in tribes, but we settled on a single territory and we started growing crops there. We stopped eating what is today called a paleo diet because before that we were, we were cavemen who had paleo diets. Now we, then we started eating grain and started having heart attacks and grew shorter. Uh, but in any case, things more or less remained that way until about 150 years ago uh, with, the, with, the, with what is called the Industrial Revolution, but really the use of steam engine and then other new technological developments, we went from being largely agricultural rural societies. I mean, in our part of the world here, Estonia, Latvia, Finland, Lithuania, Sweden, if you weren't a member of the, mobili of the nobility until the Industrial Revolution or a shopkeeper, most likely you lived in the woods or in a farm, really, in a farm uh, and didn't have much to do with the city and you lived in a farm and the best you would do was go to a village. Um, so we went some 10,000 years after we started farming, we started, um, we started moving into cities. Today, you know, we're 70%, 75% urbanization rates and countries that a hundred years ago were fundamentally uh, agrarian. And so we see that 
technological change already there is more or less following something like Moore's law, but now we're at, even at a far faster clip. Technological change, of course, then leads to all kinds of other things that in fact impact architecture, obviously, not only quality of material, but if you think about it, until we had the Industrial Revolution, um, well, the Industrial Revolution led to the internal combustion engine, which led to the car, which then Henry Ford, first off, and then everyone else, started producing at a mass rate. So everyone had to have a car. And then this led to a new phenomenon that had never been seen before, if you think about it. An interchange, a two, in Estonian, but an interchange. An overpass. There were, no one ever, no architect ever had to design an overpass until people started having cars at a massive, at a massive rate. So technology will lead, will change architecture. Now you, of course, today here are looking at architecture and what, or I'm supposed to talk about what technology and architecture will do and what it means and of course the idea of an uber which is should be pronounced uber but anyway an uber google self-driving cars you know, all kinds of sensors that measure how much traffic there is and all of those things will in fact affect and impact city planning it will impact architecture, it will impact, of course, I mean, everything. You know, you're gonna to have to plan in all kinds of, all kinds of uh, ways of regulating heating in the future. You don't have some, you're not gonna go look at your thermostat. It will all be done through feedback loops. All of that technology I call gee whiz bang. It's your latest app. What can you do now? The problem with all of that is that in the process we have paid far too little attention to the issue of security. And I would say in where there has been attention to security, it's been in the wrong area. That is, everyone is concerned about confidentiality or more public use privacy. Someone might know something about me. Someone might be listening to my phone. I mean, this is a serious concern. I agree. I don't want people snooping on my computer. I agree. No one likes that. But in the future, especially as we go into this thing that everyone is raving about, called IoT, Internet of Things, in Deutschland it's the... Uh, Industry 4.0, I don't know what it is elsewhere, it's just uh, in most countries it's Internet of Things, except you go to Germany and it's Industry 4.0. But the idea that machine, uh, computers and computer chips will be doing all kinds of things for us um, is very popular. And it's a good idea. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm the last person to be a Luddite. However, I just want to draw your attention to the fundamental issues, which is that in a world in which we become so dependent on the way chips perform on the processing of data, the level of data security today is completely inadequate. The solutions to that are, there are many solutions to those things, but, and some of them are architectural, though IT architectural, but we do have to, we all have to pay far more attention to these issues. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> In, um, in Los Angeles, the, um, the, the people in charge of traffic lights, I don't know, how many people have here been to Los Angeles? Well, if you've been in Los Angeles, I mean, it's not like Tallinn. I mean, I would say there are, I don't know, maybe not a million, but 500,000 traffic lights. Anyway, the people in charge of controlling the traffic light system decided that they wanted more money. But they didn't go on strike with picket signs. They went and 
they programmed the computers to turn all of the lights, traffic lights, red. Now, in a city of 8 million people, which is <laughs> completely car-based, you can imagine what, a, what it did to the city, that all traffic lights were red. Of course, it was very fortunate that they did it that way, because can you imagine if they'd altered the computers so that all the lights at the same time in all directions would be green? It's supposed to be funny, hello, you know? Think of Los Angeles, all these cars going through green lights and what happens? Even in Tallinn, that would happen. So this means that we are, I mean, that's an example, a primitive example of how dependent we will be on the, in the future on the security of all of these chips and computers that are regulating our lives. The focus of gee whiz bang technology in the public discussions and even in the professional discussions have all been on the front end of things, by which I mean Gee whiz, look at this app, look what it can do. Which is nice and cool, and I have all kinds of gee whiz bang apps on my computer, mainly from my daughter, I mean on my phone. But the crucial issue is what I would call the back end, how it all gets processed. It's very nice to have an app that you put in whatever you put in there. But the question is, where does it go and how is it processed? And this is going to be the real big task that we will face. Even more so, it will be, in, in, uh, it will be the case in architecture, that the sort of the physical architecture, that is going to be more and more uh, basing future buildings, future cities on, on all kinds of sensors and all kinds of uh, data processing. Most of you know what Stuxnet is, yes? This is Everyone know what stuck? Do you know what Stuxnet was? Come on, jeez. This is supposed to be out of IT, you know? Okay, Stuxnet. That was the bug that, was, that, that drove the Iranian centrifuges crazy. Um, it was designed probably by the United States and Israel, but we don't know for sure, but everyone goes nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But in any case, in order to stop the Iranian uh, nuclear bomb program, someone devised a very, very complex program that was inserted into the nuclear bomb laboratory, or rather, not the laboratory, but uh, the laboratory where the Iranians were making enriched uranium. In order to have an atomic bomb, you need enriched uranium. In order to make enriched uranium, you have to put uranium into centrifuges and spin it very quickly so the, in, so the heavier uranium is, moves out, and then you can use the heavier uranium to make enriched uranium, and from that you can make a, an atom bomb, and from that, I mean, you can also ultimately make a hydrogen bomb. In order to stop the program, somebody with a lot of money and a lot of time devised a program that would drive the computers crazy. Now, when we think about what, when we use the term hacking, we think someone goes in there and does a little thing to, to your, or sends your data somewhere else. This program does something very different, and it is the real thing to fear when we look at uh, the future of the use of IT in, in anything, which is it didn't, it didn't affect the program that the computers that were operating the centrifuges. The centrifuges, controlled by computers, those computers worked perfectly well. What the computer, what the, what the, this nasty long bug did was it altered the inputs to the computers. And so the computers responding perfectly well, unhacked computers, 
responding perfectly well to the inputs that they were getting in, would then process the inputs and then send signals back to the centrifuges that centrifuges would then basically then do what the computer told it. But the problem was the inputs they were getting were wrong, completely wrong. And so the centrifuges which were behaving normally, but the signal would go out that it's going far too slowly and the computer would say, go faster, 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 and then they would blow up. This, I mean, that's one, that's really one hardcore case of data being of what I would call the integrity problem. Data being changed, not the program, it's not traditional hacking, it is what, it is changing the data. Um, changing the data that go in and out. So when we live in a world uh, that is this ideal world in which refrigerators know when to order more milk and in which houses know when to turn up the thermostat or turn down the thermostat, it's all done via computers responding to inputs and then providing outputs. The crucial issue will be how secure are the inputs and outputs. So with a car, a self-driving car, it's not that someone will hack into it and steer your car away. It's that you, the car doesn't know where it's going or it turns the wrong way because the inputs are wrong or it will break or maybe it won't break, the brakes will not go on. These are all issues of what, can be, what is called data integrity. It is not confidentiality, it is not the bad NSA tapping your phones, it is not the bad GCHQ in the UK reading your mails, or any of the other paranoia that we have all been concerned about when we talk about, oh my God, Big Brother is coming. That's a problem. To put it differently, I really, I mean, if someone knows my medical records, which in Estonia are all electronic, and I'm not that happy about it, but frankly, I'd be much more worried if someone has changed my medical records, if someone has changed my blood type, or if someone makes me RH negative when I'm RH positive. That's what worries. That's data integrity. And that will become the fundamental issue you're going to have to worry about when we talk about all these wonderful things that IT can do for architecture, if you're going to you do talk about that. And the solutions to that, I wish I had a place to put my coffee. I keep holding this here, okay. No, they even gave me water, Gene. The, the solutions that do exist, but we just don't think about them enough, except in this country where in fact, uh, and the solutions are architectural. I'm not sure it's the kind of architecture you do, but it's how you design your system, uh, how you isolate and keep different components of data separate, how you identify who is coming in, uh, how you identify who is going from one bit of data to, to one data bank to another, how secure that is. Um, most of the failures that we've seen in computerization and with hacking in the last, uh, the la well, basically ever since the beginning, but most recently when we saw, for example, uh, well, the not very good electronic part of Obama's healthcare system, the, the hacking of Sony recently, or more scandalously, the theft of all federal employee records in the United States, complete employer, all ever people who worked for the United States government, all of their records were stolen about a month ago, two months ago. Um, <coughs> all of that is really avoidable. It's just that people don't worry about that side of the architecture if you're interested in how to do the architecture, come visit Estonia, or you are here, go visit the, uh, the showroom up on, uh, near the airport uh, that shows how it works. I'm not gonna give you a lecture on IT here. But that, those are the kind of architecture things we have to worry about. 
But when it comes to data integrity, it is crucial that we pay attention to this before we go all crazy about how wonderful the IoT is going to be and how wonderful the Google car is going to be or whatever it is that we can do with, with IT to make our lives better. Yes, it can make our lives better, but without data integrity and attention to those kinds of things, it's, uh, it could be a real disaster. As I said, I'm not a Luddite. I, in fact, am a very pro-technology person, but I try to always calm people down and say, gee whiz, look what we can do now. We can do this. And the question will be more and more, but how secure is it? If it's not secure, then you're not doing people a service by designing a city or a building using high technology, because in fact, you could end up designing a city or a building that could kill them. So I hope that all of you, from now on, <laughs> study some IT, learn to program, understand what IT is about, understand what programs are about. Um, it's, it, it is in, it, it, you are morally obligated, if you are going to use gee whiz new IT technology to build whatever it is you build, you are morally obligated to know the security of those items. Just as architects have to make sure they understand enough engineering to build a building that not only looks nice, but also won't fall down. Um, you know, we have famous cases like the Tacoma Bridge, you know, which you've all seen the film of the bridge that goes, you know, sort of waving and it collapses. Well, that was because it was, you know, it looked nice. It's just they didn't understand or they didn't think about the engineering side enough. Well, in the future, if you're going to use this new technology, it is your moral obligation to understand IT well enough to avoid the potential threats. Now, how's that for a downer speech? <laughs> I mean, the downer part is not how dangerous IT is, but it's that I just told you you have to go and study something. Well, I think you should study IT and to understand what you are doing if you're going to use this highest level of technology. So I'd like to thank you all. I wish you a wonderful conference here. If you want to know more about what we do in IT, I'm sure some of the organizers here can direct you in the direction of uh, where to learn more about it. Meanwhile, enjoy your stay here. Um, this is one of the few conferences we managed to hold when the weather is still nice. So I hope you don't stay indoors for too long. Thank you very much.